This time next week, Australia should know the answer to the proposed law to alter the constitution to recognise the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to parliament. The road to October 14 hasn't been straightforward. From the early popular support to a much more complex and difficult debate, complete with the hallmarks of modern politics, misinformation, confusion, polarisation and a lack of trust from voters. But at the end of all of this, will Australians know each other just that little bit more? This is how we live, in the shadow of the gas industry. In my backyard, in my home. My name is Raylene Cooper. I'm a traditional custodian for the Mother Donia area. I've been here living in the Pilbara for some time now, over 20 years. I don't need to hold a science degree or an ac be an academic um, to know and understand that there's something truly going wrong in my area. There's a really huge problem in our mining and government decision makers who are giving those authorities to talk for this place when there is so much universal value. This place is over a million petroglyphs of rock art, which each containing and holding stories, so it's really concerning. Our culture and the environment ecosystems, they're all one, they all work as one. You're talking about a break and disconnection to our song lines, because our songs here, they travel right through to the other side of Australia and back. I want to challenge this, because I have a right to ask the questions. I just need someone to give me an answer, and someone is to be held accountable. They have set a precedent and I think they're teaching us how we can all come back together as a people um, because unity is one thing that nobody wants us to be. So that there is welcome you guys to Murujuga and basically in that welcome I told them that we all come together as one people on the country that big emu up there, and have you guys see that fellow there? So we call that one Jangana. That's the original carving of it. So this is like the original Mona Lisa. And this is what we do, fight for our country, Muradruga land and sea. I can't leave this world without making it right for my kids and my grandkids. And I hope you follow in the same footprint because I know you guys feel the same. My name is Michael Woodley. I'm an Ijibani man. We are on a place called Ngoroana community on Ijibani country. And the FMG Solomon mine is southeast, roughly maybe 200 k's away from it. 75% of it is on Ijibani country or Ijibani Ngora. Where I'm taking you guys now is to look at a archeological site where my old people used to come in and make stone tools. This is my home. This is the thing that makes me relevant. This is a, a knife for the hunting. This is culturally significant for me, or for the Ijibani, because this is proof of occupation, where Ijibani been and sitting down and making these, making these artifacts. Living in the shadows of mining is very disempowering. This should never should have happened at all, the mine. I've been to that country a long time before it got damaged. I went with the old people, with the elders. And the country was just so beautiful. The purple hills and the wild bush flowers were there. And for that place to get damaged, it really, you know, break my heart, you know, because we got a lot of spiritual sites here, spirits here, that lives here. And that belongs to country, belongs to the Ngura.
in this case, you know, it's, it's, it's not David, you know, fighting Goliath, it's fighting Goliath's entire family, you know. We know who we're up against. In this case, it's, it's a mining company that's not wanting to do the right thing. But when you have the state government that sits equally in support of a mining company for these type of, you know, projects, it makes it even more challenging. And that's why I think this case is very important. This particular issue goes to the heart of compensation for a mining operation without our free prime informed consent. We think it's now a significant sort of a moment in our time. You know? It's a case that's going to you know, determine what a mining company you know, pays in compensation if they don't do the right thing under the Native Title Act. The other anybody shouldn't have divided, you know, with us. They should have stayed with us. But with all the turmoil and uh, fights that have been happening, you know, it has really, um, it has challenged me, but it has also hurt me. So when I see them fighting, I just, I, I'm, I'm not happy at all. They're both significant. One, because it tells us a lot more about your obligation to consult before you do something that might impact. The other one, because it will tell us a lot more about how the courts will value native title that's been lost or impaired through mining activity. The court will also look at the impact on spiritual connection, so uh, damage to sites. It's very difficult for courts to come up with dollar figures to compensate First Nations people for loss and damage to spiritual sites. Traditional owner groups are aware of these cases um, they're aware of their rights that perhaps 30 years ago they wouldn't have been given any recognition, and now they will be. It doesn't matter which company, you know, they are not above the law, and certainly Woodside is not above the law. Um, the decisions that were made in this court today, I'm so very grateful. Our whales, our dreaming stories, turtles, they all have a purpose. You know, we have a purpose. Water is the most valuable. It's our animals and our plants. They can't talk. We have a voice for them. And that's why I'm here, to talk on behalf of you know, those who can't talk for themselves. And every creature, every being that has a heartbeat deserves to be protected and looked after. So we're standing on the lands of the Ngunnawal, Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who were the first inhabitants of this place. Country's a world view. We spell it with a capital C. Country is not just a land you walk on it's, or picnic on. We see country as a personage, as a living being. It holds the wisdom and it holds the knowledge and all the features so all the stories you need to know in order to survive in country come from country. So country holds knowledge, our stories are written in country, and if you stay connected, you'll stay knowledgeable. Caring for country is much more than cleaning water holes. It's actually caring for it as you would your mother or your relative or a person. You've got to care for it ancestrally, spiritually. When you perform, you just, your performance ceremony goes into the ground. Um, the songs you tell on country are you're telling to country as well as each other. Pay homage to the ancestors of that place. So caring for country is so much more than the physical. 
you know, individuals all have a relationship with country in their country, their sites. And therefore, it's there. the reason they're almost assigned a totem or a, an area of land is so that they will feel responsible for and keep that country clean, healthy, alive, and to increase the resources. Song lines, you can visualise as kind of um, corridors or pathways of knowledge that crisscross the entire continent as all the natural features of the land are linked by these lines. So all of these sites behave as a mnemonic or a memory aid. The knowledge you get is knowledge that's critical uh, for your survival, you know, social behaviour or where the water is or the food resources. And so they have these sort of stories that are like metaphors. There's a great variation in song lines. There's, there's epic ones that traverse the entire continent, such as the Seven Sisters story. Every country or language group across the desert tells a, a different episode of the great chase as it was, the great chase across the land, because each country they come to has a different formation. There's a cave, and what's that got to do with anything? The people there are responsible for that story. So they will talk about how the women went in there to hide, the pursuers waited outside, and various interactions occurred. Now that'll happen all around the place to explain the presence of, of you know, various things, including, you know, 100 kilometres of land you, are, you shouldn't walk across. So the story will say, they flew, which means don't walk, there's no water. Now the other one, the smaller, there are in, in fact smaller regional song lines. They're really about how you catch the wallaby or where the bush tomatoes are in harvest and of course in an Aboriginal non-text based society. It is mnemonics that you learn through and consider this, 65,000 years, some of these stories from way back then are still alive today. Knock, knock. Hello. Hello. Who have we got here? Hello, I'm Isabella. Thank you for coming. Yes. Look at these beautiful photographs you've got everywhere. Oh, and I can great. already tell you've got a big family. I have. I've got eight of my own, and from them I've got 154 grannies. Five generations. 154? Yes. 154 and I'm an only child. Auntie Ruth Hegarty has lived a big life. Her story is full of lessons as the nation prepares for a historic vote. Auntie Ruth, we have this amazing photograph in front of us. Can you tell me who's in this? If you were a dormitory kid, you were called dormitory kids. And the kids that lived in the campsite were camp kids. Born in Queensland in 1929 when Indigenous people had few rights and their movements were controlled by the state. From six months old, she lived at Sherberg, then known as the Baramba Aboriginal Mission, where she was separated from her family and later forced into work. I, I only knew that home. That was the only home that I knew. And these girls, we all grew up like sisters. My mum. Ruth was only four when she was split up from her mum at the mission. She says her rebellious streak often got her in trouble. And I'd sneak off down to the schoolyard every day. So Matron said to my mum, I'm going to send Ruth to school. Mum said, she's too young. That first day at school, um, she wasn't allowed to come near me. I've heard it was quite tough to live here It at was times. tough. I was sitting at that lattice work calling out, Mum, Mum, where are you? She said, I heard you every time that you called out, but I could not come to you because we would get into trouble. So you were a small girl yelling out for your mum. Yes. Your mum could hear you. Her mother was sent away to work, only allowed to return via permit once a year. Ruth would meet the same fate, becoming a domestic servant. A 14-year-old signing an agreement at the, at the Sherberg uh, office to say that you will be a good girl, 
You will do everything your mistress wants you to do. Government needed our monies. It needed us to work so that they could take half of our pay. Did you ever see any of that money again? We did see some of it. We did see some of it. But we had to march, you know, do street marches to get it. And it eventually led to the stolen wages compensation. That's right. Was that a moment where you felt like your voice wasn't listened to? It, it wasn't listened to at that time. And that's exactly what's been going on all those years. They don't listen to us at all. Vote yes, give them rights and freedoms just like me and you. Vote yes. In 1967, Australia voted overwhelmingly to include all Indigenous peoples in the population count. Ruth remembers the exciting period of change that came after the national vote. We fought the government for all of these things that we have, that we were able to enjoy. We got legal aid, you know, we got health centres, we made sure that the kids had education, good education. The 94-year-old overcame great hardship to become an award-winning author, educator and community activist. She didn't expect to see another referendum in her lifetime. It's finished September. We've got the then the referendum coming up quite soon. Yes. Then on the 14th. On the 14th, that's after the so, appointment. So, how are you feeling about it? I'm feeling positive. Yeah. I'm a real positive person. That's good, yeah. that's good. Ruth's daughter Moira is campaigning for the yes side. Well, that's the change that we are looking for. Well, you've been at it, Mum, since, since yeah. I've been born. That's right. And that's 66 years ago. That's right. Can I ask you, there might be some people within the Aboriginal community who feel really nervous about the referendum. They do feel nervous, and I can agree with them. And nervous if it's a no as well. It won't be a no. What? I'm going to say that to you. It won't be a no. I mean, if we don't get the yes vote, it'll be a time of mourning. It would be a terrible day for us all. We want the government to listen to us. What's your hope for Australia for the future? There's a lot more work to be done. I believe that there's a lot more, but it's, it's something that, you know, the generation after that's got to do this work. They've got to. Hi, my name is Lauren Watson and I am an undecided voter. I'm from the Huon Valley in southern Tasmania. I am a single mum of three kids and I work part-time as a barista. I've always grown up with a deep respect for Indigenous culture. I was born in a mining town in Western Australia, so all my baby photos were surrounded by Indigenous Australians, Indigenous culture. When I first heard it, it seems like an obvious yes, but then I started hearing some really interesting perspectives coming from the no camp. Um, and so I started delving into those, um, those opinions. But what I'm hearing from Indigenous Australians around the no vote, which I'd really like more clar clarification around, is they feel that it may cause more division, um, which is already, already here in Australia. Um, they also feel that Australian Parliament was set up in a racist colonial system and we're just trying to put something into that system that may benefit Indigenous Australians, but what they want, I believe, is a total overhaul of the system. I would really like these valid concerns from our Indigenous Australians who are voting no or are telling their reasons why they're going to vote no. I would like them to be heard and to be really get into the nitty gritty of those reasons, rather than them being brushed aside or rather than going, well, they're not important issues. I would have to see those questions really being validated with good answers. I'm, I'm particularly interested in our Indigenous voices though and what, what they want. And I'm hearing very strong arguments for yes, very strong arguments for no on both sides. 
Hi, I'm Dan Borsha, the ABC's Voice and Referendum Correspondent, and I'm checking the pulse of the campaign. With me today is my friend and colleague, the ABC's Indigenous Affairs Editor, Bridget Brennan. Great to have you along, Bridget. Great to be with you, Dan. And this time next week, we should know the answer to that question that was posed, you know, a little over a year ago at Gama in Arnhem Land. And we were both there, Dan, when the Prime Minister gave that historic speech. Bridget, at that time we were there on Yolongo country, you were heavily pregnant, standing on a box. I was standing <laughs> alongside you, we were listening to the Prime Minister go through what that proposal would be. It seemed like there was going to be a very focused road to referendum from there but what we've actually seen is anything but. At Gama, he foreshadowed actually, it was really interesting, I went back and had a look at his speech. Even though he said this proposal was going to be really simple and clear and that there was nothing to worry about, he actually foreshadowed that, that he thought there might be some misinformation and fear once the campaign um, went underway. So it's interesting that even then the government could see that this was potentially going to be a really polarising and difficult debate for them to manage. But what we've seen over this last 18 months or so has been really fascinating. On one hand, I've heard and, and met so many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are wanting to talk about the past and, and the impacts of policies on them. So there's been, in a sense, a lot of truth telling, I think, happening from our communities. But then on the other side, it's also unleashed quite a lot of vitriol, racism, anger, misinformation and disinformation has been just extraordinary. If you go back to the Uluru statement from the heart when that was released, you were there. I, I was there, yeah, and, which you know was such a privilege um, at that time to hear um, from people on the ground about what they thought was necessary for us to move forward as a unified country. A lot of Indigenous elders will say, we haven't really told the truth. We haven't had that truth and justice process that we've seen in other nations. And I think in, in some ways that is playing out now because there's still debate over parts of our history that many of us thought we had kind of settled and we had moved forward as a nation on some of those questions about our history. But actually, uh, it, it isn't for some people. A lot of people haven't engaged much with Indigenous history and rights and our struggles. And so it's led to this kind of very ugly debate where it's opened up for some elements in our community to put a question mark over, you know, do, do Indigenous people really suffer from colonisation? Potentially because we've never had that formal truth telling process. And if you look in Victoria, where I'm from, there is Australia's first, first Truth Commission underway alongside a treaty process to really give elders the chance to tell their stories um, in a way that we haven't really seen before in this nation. Bridges, we head into this final week. What are you sensing is the focus of the campaigns? We're hearing a lot of anecdotal you know, reports from on the ground from polling booths and from those who are door knocking and are on the ground about how things might be shifting in the final weeks. But Casey Briggs has been looking at it over a long period of time and he's been having a look this week at any potential shifts in, in opinion on The Voice. In the first months of Anthony Albanese's time as PM, when he'd committed to holding this referendum, but before the question was finalised and the debate was at full intensity, support for The Voice then seemed strong. We were looking at as many as two thirds of people supporting the idea. But as we entered 2023, the slide started and it sped up around about April. That coincides with the time the Liberal Party and Peter Dutton formalised their opposition to The Voice. We've been averaging polls into a single trend line because there's more value in looking at all the polls rather than focusing on a single one. And the trend line, well, it's been bad for prospects of the referendum passing. As of Friday, Yes is sitting on about 41.4% across the polls, behind No by more than 18 percentage points. That's not a prediction of the result. Polls are only ever snapshots in time. And of course, we know support varies in different communities. The general and consistent pattern is that Yes support is strongest in the inner cities and it falls away in the outer suburbs and regional and remote areas. That's an average. Regional Australia is obviously very diverse and it's likely that Cooktown will vote differently to Cape York. The votes in Walgett will look different to Wyala, same for Parramatta and Port Augusta. And none of the polls that have been published have sample sizes big enough to know what those differences will look like. 
Campaigns are doing much more polling than we've seen publicly. It's possible they have a better sense for how individual communities are feeling. But for the rest of us, there's not a lot of polling evidence. We're going to have to wait for one more week until actual votes are counted. So the Yes campaign, it's been interesting, they've been out with health professionals, with doctors who support the Yes case, and they're really getting back to that message of this is about disadvantage, this is about closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Whereas the No campaign is really sticking to its line that this is a divisive proposal for Australians to have to consider. And they know that that's really resonating uh, with undecided voters or those that are sort of on the soft Yes and perhaps going over to No. So we're going to see the Yes and the No campaign really get back to the messages they think will resonate with the undecided Australians. Briggs, there's been a lot in the media uh, discussions about the different perspectives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, some saying that it's division, in fact some even saying through this campaign that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people can't even decide as there were a homogenous group who should have one singular view, which is incredibly problematic because we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people with completely different lived experience and views on everything so why would this be any different? Well I think it speaks to our misunderstanding and our lack of understanding of the diversity of all of our different nations around the country and I think it also speaks to the work that still needs to be done in our media Dan because if you look around the media landscape in Australia there are very few Indigenous Affairs reporters, there's very few Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in newsrooms but I'd also say that it's been kind of um, you know it has been a tool for those uh, some elements in our media to really latch on to, oh look, Indigenous people say one thing but this group says another. Whereas we should be allowed to have a respectful debate. We know that Aboriginal families are having a respectful debate. There are different views even within family members and different nations and communities. But we do know that some polls suggest that about 80% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people support the voice, the voice and most of our main Indigenous organisations have come out in support of the voice. But we shouldn't silence the progressive no case as well because it has a long history in Indigenous activism in this country. Yeah, and as one elder put it to me from Yulungu country where we started this conversation, I said to her, what happens the next day regardless of the outcome? And she said, yes or no. We get, up, we get up, we get on with yeah, it. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's going to be another conversation. There. We do because I mean, all you know, so many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people I know and you know are related to or um, are friends with um, just work for our people day and night. I mean, it's why I do the work I do to tell the stories of our people. It's you know what gets me out of bed every morning and the amount of people I meet in my job who just work seven days a week. They run their organisations on the smell of an oily rag. They are working every day for their family, for the betterment of this nation and for their own nations. And it's really, really inspiring. And so that's that, what underpins that is resilience. And it's been there for thousands and thousands of years and it will continue regardless of what has been a pretty toxic debate. Bridget, so great to, to check the pulse of the campaign with you. Great to be with you.